help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Okay, welcome back to the Ancient Christian Writers series. And we're picking up again this evening with our reading of St. John Cassian's conferences. And we're currently on the 20th conference entitled On Repentance, On the End of Repentance, and the Marks of Reparation. And we're almost through, through it in its entire, entirety. We're on section 9 on page 701. And so we've been looking at uh, the view of re repentance and reparation, how it is that we embrace the, the grace of God, his mercy, his forgiveness, and how it's to be embraced in all of its fullness. And so we've also looked at conscience as well as being the indicator for us of how deep that repentance has become in the sense that we've let go of particular sins in our life and then there has been such a, a reparation that has taken place, a repair of the damage done by sin that even the disposition to sin has been removed and that's when the sting of conscience also disappears for us as well. And so it's a very challenging conference because it's calling us to perhaps a, a deeper level of repentance and a deeper pursuit of holiness than we've thought of in the past. The idea that when we come out of the confessional and we take hold of the grace that God has given to us, that the grace is provided for us to not commit that sin again. And also the grace to uh, embrace uh, the disciplines necessary in order to uproot the disposition to that particular sin. And uh, we can become uh, sort of habitual in our practice of uh, engaging the sacrament uh, in the sense of going in uh, and experiencing a kind of psychological relief perhaps, uh, uh, an emotional release from a sense of shame or guilt, but not having the clarity of thought about how it is that we are to embrace the grace that is given to us here, the power of that grace, what it's to mean for our life, how we are to embrace it in all of its fullness. And this is where Cassian, or is it, the, who's the Abba in this one again? Panufius, mm -hmm. who uh, has been challenging us. We're on section nine, as I had mentioned. And they had been talking about uh, how one might draw to mind past sins uh, as a way of reflecting upon them, of drawing oneself more deeply into repentance. Uh, and also to think about how to uproot them. But we're given a warning here that that kind of use of the memory uh, isn't to take place in regards to carnal sins, that to uh, sort of enliven the memory or the imagination in regards to particular sins can draw us back into them. And so kind of care and watchfulness is to be uh, taken here in regard to these, these particular sins. And so we begin, as I said, in section 9. But you ought not at all to reflect intently upon the memory of past sins, as you said before. Indeed, if this comes upon you violently, it should at once be thrust out. For this greatly withdraws the mind from the contemplation of purity, especially in the case of one who lives in the desert, involving it in the filth of this world and suffocating it in the stench of the vices. When you reconsider the things that you perpetrated out of ignorance or wantonness when you were following the prince of this world, although I grant you that no delight may be steal, stealing in as you dwell on these thoughts, it is certainly inevitable that the merest contact with something putrid from the past will, with its foul stench, contaminate <clears throat> the mind and cut off the spiritual fragrance of the virtues that is, the sweetness of their good odor. And so these in particular then can draw us away from reflecting upon that which is more virtuous. And so in our spiritual struggle at this point, the, the focus should be on, on the virtue, the opposite of the vice in this case. Okay. When therefore the memory of past vices upsets the mind, one must recoil from it, just as an upright and serious man flees 
if a shameless and impudent woman tries to speak with him or embrace him in public. Indeed, if he does not remove himself from contact with her at once and permits even the briefest delay for an immoral conversation, he will not avoid a notorious and blameworthy reputation in the judgment of all onlookers, even if he does not consent to shameful pleasure. Is everybody okay with that? <laughs> not very PC, is it? Yes. Um, I'm just thinking of all the uh, interactions that I had with, uh, I worked in a place called the Franciscan Center in Baltimore. And we were, we were serving, you know, uh, the unfortunate of Baltimore, among whom are some of uh, our most lively citizens. And uh, so there would be plenty of opportunities to have, you know, any kind of interaction, especially with almost impossible to avoid if that was what they had on their mind or if they were very, 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 very high. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's interesting. I mean, it's uh, almost impossible to avoid, uh, especially if one's in the city and is trying to serve in yeah. a certain setting. Right. And here specifically he is speaking of monks who had embraced a particular kind of life and who would be guarding, you know, a kind of purity of heart uh, very closely. But I think even as difficult as this is to think about, um, I think we need to examine it in the sense of our interactions with one another because uh, I think we can, can find ourselves in situations uh, where there is a kind of familiarity in the way that we relate to, to each other. And it can be completely innocent. Uh, of, of course, you know, and no, uh, no kind of sin there. But I think what the, the Desert Fathers would point out, and even Philip Neary as well, who much, much later, 16th century, was very cautious about this in terms of the, the public display and interaction there, that there would be a, a guardedness that might seem rather stern to modern minds and even a little bit uh, puritanical. But Philip was uh, formed in many ways by Cassian and Climacus in his spiritual life. And so uh, in much the same way in his interactions with women, he did follow this counsel. And it's always been a little bit um, odd for me as an oratorian to think about that, that there was one woman who came to confession to him for 30 or 40 years and said that he never looked at her. Uh, in the course of confession. He never made eye contact with her. And to, again, modern minds, that seems a bit strange. But Philip was also a man of extraordinary chastity and purity of heart and, and embraced the counsels of the Desert Fathers in, in, in great measure. And so there's something, I think, there for us to think about. Again, the kind of familiarity that we have in our relations with each other, not just in touch, but I think also in speech. Uh, the, I think there is a, a loss of a sense of boundaries that we, we have in our day and the way that we interact with each other uh, in our conversations. And again, it doesn't have to be something that would be sinful, but it might be something that is a, a, a little overly intimate, you know, in terms of sharing uh, more intimate details. And I think it's something that's sort of fostered in our culture. We have reality television where everybody's spilling the beans about themselves and every family member. And so there is this sense that that's a good thing, that you're open and that you're accepting and you're warm and loving if you sort of enter into this indiscriminately. And I think what the Desert Fathers are telling us is that the, the mind and the heart are very impressionable. And it doesn't take much in order to stir the uh, imagination, uh, which later that can take hold of ideas, thoughts, images, and then become uh, a kind of uh, dialogue within us, a kind of fantasy begins to develop when those images uh, begin to connect together. And so for those who are embracing it, this uh, life of watchfulness in a very deep way in the desert, uh, 
watching what's going on in their heart in, in great measure, that they could see how quickly the heart could turn in that direction. And we are often ob oblivious to it because we aren't as attentive to it or see the importance of it. In fact, we can scorn it. And I think it's hard now for us because it would mean uh, resetting boundaries, reestablishing the ways that we interact with, with people. Um, and that can be very difficult. Uh, and I think it, again, puts us in a position where we might be scrutinized a little bit. It doesn't mean that one would have to be cold, certainly. But I, I think it is, again, being more watchful of what's going on within the mind and the heart. Even in the secular world, among uh, like psychotherapists, that there is this sense that there is even a kind of an anonymity there that's created. And uh, it's really tight boundaries because of the nature of the work to be done. And uh, so this also comes into play, though, in our day-to-day -day spiritual life, that we would have a kind of watchfulness, perhaps not as controlled as a psychoanalyst would have with a client, but one that would be watchful for a different reason uh, because of also what's going on within, within one's own heart and mind. And in fact, this is one of the reasons analysts do that, too, because they have to be attentive to countertransference, that what their, uh, what the uh, analysis and is saying to them can provoke things within them in their own minds and their hearts. And so sometimes they have to enter in back into analysis to talk about what's going on with them in order to gain clarity about what's taking place within the relationship with their analysis. And so these are, Early Desert Fathers, I think in many, way, many ways, were like deaf psychologists. They knew these subtle movements that take place within the mind and the heart. And so what Abba Panufius is saying here is that uh, when you're seeking that higher level of repentance and reparation, perfection, seeking to maintain that purity of heart, that you, you need to be watchful and guarded in your interactions with others, and in particular those of, of the opposite sex. Because of the natural, not because there's something evil there, but because of the natural attraction and the power there that can develop on a physical and emotional level. And you know, Philip Neary even said that, that this was true in regards to our interactions with fellow members of the community of the same sex, you know, in terms of how we interact with each other, touch each other, you know, that there is a, a kind of watchfulness there in our day-to-day -day behaviors. <clears throat> that all things have meaning for us. And every interaction between us is sexual. Because I'm a male, you're a female, you're a male, you know, every every interaction that we have is filtered through this reality of who we are as human beings. And so there's a kind of wisdom there that would tell us we can't ignore that, not because it's evil, but because there's something very powerful about it. And I think we need only look at how often it happens uh, within marriages or just in general that uh, you know, the kind of uh, uh, emotional relationship can develop and then lead people in, in a certain direction, even if they are in a committed relationship in, in a marriage. Uh, and precisely because there wasn't an attentiveness to what is going on within. There might have been be something genuinely satisfying uh, an emotional need there, but it pulls them in a direction that ultimately is harmful. And so instead of addressing the emotional or spiritual need, they're drawn into a particular sin that often has re enormous repercussions for their own life and the lives of others. So before we dismiss a paragraph like this as being harsh or you know, only meaningful for those living in the desert, I think it has even more meaning for us today. Yes? Uh, I was at a reflection for men one time, and the priest said, 
in, in a conversation with a woman, these are all married men, and he said, uh, set the boundary at the outset of the conversation. So if you're at a, a store and there's an attractive sales lady that wants to sell you something, you know, just interject things like, well, that's something my wife would probably like too. Just set the tone, you know, kind of like, you know, I'm not available, you know, just by what you say, you know, so that you don't go down that path because you've already established that I'm married and, you know, I'm, and we can't go any further than, than that, you know. So that was pretty good advice, I thought. Well, I think it's the, the pursuit, I think the way that we would want to uh, focus upon it is the d going back to where Cassian began and it's the pursuit of purity of heart that uh, we desire to protect that for ourselves and for others. And so in our day-to-day -day <coughs> interactions, we would simply seek to be watchful of what's going through our mind and heart. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to deliberately throw up these you know, huge boundaries in every interaction that we, we have, because I think that could break down a kind of intimacy that could develop. But if, if we are going to have that, that means a kind of honesty and humility that we have is going to have to be very deep as we examine our, our hearts and our actions, our relationships, that uh, we have to be very clear with ourselves that, okay, you know, there's something stirring within my heart, you know, that might be true, and I have to be able to deal with this on an emotional and spiritual level. You know, a priest doesn't seek, for example, to be a man because he becomes a priest. And, you know, an analyst, for example, who is uh, working with a woman, uh, she might be very attractive, you know, physically and emotionally. And, uh, and so it can stir things from within. And so he's going to have to be very attentive to what's going on there and trying to understand what that might be saying about the person that he's working with, but also what that is saying about himself and what's going on within his own mind and heart so that he has a bil an ability to discern what's really going on there and what, what that interaction has, what meaning it, it has. And that can be a very confusing thing. And so I think we find certain saints taking the safer path, which is to be very deliberate in those interactions. And I think like in Philip's day, he thought, well, there are many uh, women's religious communities that if women were seeking spiritual counsel that they could go there. And so even in the early oratory, you, Philip was dealing more with men, the men, young men in Rome, uh, in terms of engaging them, teaching them the faith, having them the, the secular oratory or the little oratory was made up of all men. There weren't any women who were part of it. <laughs> I know, that's <laughs> very sad. But, uh, but I think that was part of what was, and culturally too, there was something supportive of that too, that uh, the, those kind of interactions were, were guarded more closely. Well, it just, it, it seems to make, I, a book I was reading um, recently, that Kent Lamessa one, um, mm -hmm. if anyone could read that anytime, uh, it was talking about how the, the, the crassness of our language, the way we speak about things so openly, but kind of brazenly, it, it's, it displays the, the disease of not having any idea how to approach sexuality anymore, and this, this great dis-ease with it that spawns this well I'm just I'm just gonna talk about it all the time with anybody because I because I because it's fine and like I you know but, and so to but to not do that but to still engage but with an understanding of the the strength and the power of that and the presence of that, I mean, that takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. So it would, it would make a lot of sense that, like, okay, I don't want to dedicate tons of time to being mm -hmm. so careful mm -hmm. about how I interact with this person. And like, so that it's sort of like those are the two options. Mm -hmm. You either spend a lot of time being very discerning and careful and discreet and 
coming to understand the reality and the the power of the things that make you human or you just make it not a thing that you have to think or worry about. But I think we want to avoid a kind of the spirit of Puritanism. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to be moralistic about it. I think it has to be realistic in the sense of that we understand, you know, that these realities for us as human beings and how powerful they can be. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say a fortress makes a really good prison. That's right. Right. That's, that's a good point. I feel like even in just like our everyday interactions, like you. I think you know when you're crossing the line, even if it's really subtle and it's not brazen. You kind of know, you know, when you're talking to the opposite sex or or anyone that I think you can feel when you're just kind of gone just a little bit over what you should say. Well, or, I think if we are sensitive and, and you know, if there is a kind of humility there that is truthful living. You know, that we are willing to acknowledge, you know, those feelings or thoughts within us as they occur. But I think what we see happening in the culture among Christians, too, is a desensitizing there. And, uh, and part of that, I think, is because of the whole sexual revolution. There was this sense that there, there was this opening up in the view of the human person, you know, pe freeing people from the sh shackles of, you know, a kind of Puritanism. And, uh, but it was, you know, the way that it was embraced, it was, you know, in, indiscriminate. Well, let's look a little further for you to see. Number three on 702. When we have been led astray by dangerous recollection into thoughts of this kind, then we too should quickly give up reflecting on them and fulfill what is commanded by Solomon. Go forth, he says, do not tarry in her place or set your eye on her. Otherwise, the angels, seeing us taken up with impure and vile thoughts, will not be able to say to us as they pass by, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. For it is impossible for the mind to linger upon good thoughts when the heart's principal concern is given over to vile and earthly considerations. The words of Solomon are true. When your eyes see a strange woman, then your mouth will speak wicked things, and you will lie, as it were, in the heart of the sea, and like a pilot in a great storm. But you will say, they strike me, but I did not grieve, and they mock me, but I was unaware. So, you know, in our day, we don't even, it's not even in the, the, the uh, context of our interrelations with one another, personal, I think, because we have computers and television, I think we are exposed to certain interactions there where, again, we can be, uh, we can lack discretion in terms of what we expose ourselves to, you know, thinking again that it's innocent and that somehow the images and the interaction, you know, it's a virtual reality there, but nonetheless, it has an impact upon us. And so we have to be discerning in terms of what we expose ourselves to so as not to uh, inflame the passions in any kind of way. Any thoughts? All right. Paragraph 5. Having abandoned, therefore, not only every vile thought, but also every earthly one, the attention of our mind should always be raised to heavenly things in accordance with the words of our Savior. Where I am, he says, there also will my servant be. For it frequently happens that when a person reflects with a commiserating spirit on his own falls or those of others, he himself is also struck by the pleasurable feeling of a very subtle dart, and what was begun under the guise of goodness concludes with a filthy and harmful ending. For there are paths that seem right in the sight of men, but they arrive finally at the depths of hell. So it can seem somewhat innocent that it would be good to reflect upon even another person's <clears throat> falling, you know, as sort of a, a warning to us. But what he's saying here is that there can be, you know, the 
underlying temptation of the evil one here that eventually that it will stir something up within us to the point that all of a sudden we're caught in a storm and once that happens it's very difficult uh, to remain safe from the temptation hence we must seek to rouse ourselves to this praiseworthy compunction by yearning for virtue and a desire for the kingdom of heaven rather than by harmful recollections of vice because anyone who chooses to stand over a sewer or to stir up its muck will inevitably be suffocated by its pestilential stench <laughs> awesome paragraph <laughs> uh, And so I like his point here, though, that you know, the shift takes place to the love of virtue and the desire for virtue. And ultimately, that is the more powerful thing in the spiritual life. That I think when we're embattled, especially early on with the passions, we can be so focused upon them because of the misery that they cause us. And we can become overly focused upon them to the point that they cause us anxiety and we're in our battle, we're focused on them to the extent that we lose sight of God and also to the life that he's called us to. Uh, but in the end, it's the, the beauty of virtue and the beauty of that love and intimacy with God that is the more powerful thing that makes the desire for sins begin to dissipate. And so we're not so much locked in a struggle anymore as reaching out in desire for God. This is why we, we don't want to treat desire as something evil, because it's desire that leads us to God. Desire, as you might remember, we said it means a sense of lack or incompleteness. And so if we cut off desire within us, then we're also going to cut off the very thing that draws us to the arms of God. So we can't treat the passions as something evil, but rather that which has to be transformed by the grace of God and ultimately lead us to God. If we just strike, it, strike them out and kill a part of ourselves, say, you know, our sexual desire, then we're also going to impoverish ourselves on some level. We're going, if we strip ourselves that deeply of desire, either it won't work, it'll just manifest itself in other ways in our lives or at a different time, or it'll, it'll distort our personality as human beings. This is how we've been created. And so if we cut a part of ourselves off, then we're going to even lose our capacity to love others as well as love God. So we want to be careful of not falling in to that pure puritanical streak, you know, where we, we make these things into something evil and ugly. It's hard not to, I think, in our day because so much of it is very ugly in our, our culture. That as Catholic Christians, we, we don't want to go there in a reactionary kind of way. We really want to keep our perspective. I just thought that last thing you said was really interesting, and I'm kind of wondering, I think, you know, especially in our culture where we're so bombarded by distorted sexuality, how do you regain a sense of it as, as good in order to not, in order to guard against the desire to just cast it all away together? Because what we tend to see in everything is what is actually distorted mm -hmm. and um, to, to varying levels, um, you know, evil. So that would be kind of a hard thing to do to, to get rid of all that is truly bad and, and to try to keep this sense of what's good. And right. Yeah, because it almost feels like a losing battle. Yeah. But uh, I think John Paul II sought to do that through his theology of the body. The, to open up this vision for Catholic Christians. And in large part, that has taken place. I mean, you can see how people have gravitated to it and are very attracted to it. I think 
the only thing that needs to be added to that is the fullness of the spiritual tradition then that also seeks purity of heart that allows us and gives us that capacity to love as we should. It has to be tied to the ascetical and spiritual tradition. Otherwise, it becomes romanticized. And I think a lot of times that happens with the, the theology of the body. Uh, you know, it, it holds a certain attraction, but it can sort of do exactly, I think, what these Desert Fathers are warming, warning about. You know, it can cr romanticize things and sort of, you know, lead people to have it on their mind all the time and neglect the need to form the mind and the heart in such a way that the, the, the passions can be transformed. So it can't be just an in intellectual thing. We can't approach, approach it only in this notional way by reading the theology of the body. We have to have a lived experiential knowledge of what it is to live the spiritual life and to transform, to have the passions transformed by the grace of God. So in an interesting way, I don't think I would tell a person to read the theology of the body first. I, I think I would introduce them to the Desert Fathers and in order to give them the means, you know, to have this broader understanding of the human person and the, also the means to be able to address, to enter into the struggle more fully so that the, the passions can be transformed. It is beautiful. You know, I think it's a real gift to the church. I think our tendency, though, is to fall into a kind of rationalism, rationality, to approach the, the spiritual life in that way, rather than you know, entering into this experience of the mystery of God and coming to know him through living the life fully that we've been called to, the life of grace. Yes. Don't you think that's an uh, important distinction, though, between uh, desire and concupiscence? It's such a weird word, I even hate to say it, but that, that inclination that is so intrinsic to our nature that, that we're, we tilt towards sin, whether we want to or not, and that if we're not careful, we can take the good desire, pure desire, and, and roll that up with concupiscence, and it just gets to be a, a big mess. Mm -hmm. And so it seemed like John Paul, he took the beauty of human sexuality and pulled it out of the market. He just mm -hmm. set it there in such a pure way. Right. But the fathers would say we still struggle with concupiscence. And That's right. We I still think, need to fight I think that, they would right? have appreciated the writing and the vision of the human person. But uh, we don't want to disconnect it from then the fullness of the tradition precisely because of what you said. We have a weakened will, a darkened intellect uh, because of, of the fall, because of our sin. And so that reality has to be addressed, not only that we can understand, I think, what the Holy Father wrote, but all live it in all of its fullness. I think that's really true with like uh, with youth groups and things. Like obviously there's a good in, in like chastity topics and stuff, but when you have like a group of teenagers and all they ever do is talk about chastity, they're still talking about sex all the time. And like that's not exactly ideal, you know, it just becomes the new way for them to release that desire to have it on the mind all the time and talk about it all the time. It's just like <laughs> you know, it just doesn't work all that well. Yeah, I think it, it is sort of an interesting thing, you know, in terms of how we sort of turn the tide in regards to personal formation and to reintroduce the people to the fullness of the tr tradition, not simply bits and piece of it, pieces of it, not to do it in a piecemeal fashion where it can never really have any lasting impact 
upon their lives. So starting very young, there has to be a kind of culture that we would be immersed in that would help foster this greater vision of the human person, but also give us the, the means that we need to, to really live that life. And so absent that, I think it's, it's very difficult. So, okay, let's move on. Here we're at uh, section 11. But we know, as we have often said, that we have made reparation for past sins precisely when these very movements and dispositions, in accordance with which we perpetrated regrettable acts, have been cut out of our hearts. Yet no one should believe himself capable of attaining to this who has not first cut away with all the fervor of his spirit the very causes and matter whereby he fell into those misdeeds. For example, if someone has fallen into fornication or adultery because of a dangerous familiarity with women, he should make every effort to avoid even looking at them. Or if he has been inflamed by too much wine and by overeating, he should certainly discipline this gluttony for unlawful food with the utmost strictness. Again, if he has been corrupted by a desire and love for money and commits perjury or theft or murder or blasphemy, he should cut off the stuff of avarice that seduced him into being deceived. If he is forced by the passion of pride into the vice of anger, he should pull out the root of this arrogance with the lofty virtue of humility. Thus, in order for each sin to be extinguished, the cause and the occasion by which or on account of which it was committed, must be cut out at the very beginning. There is no doubt that by this healing remedy, a person may attain to the forgetfulness of the sins that he has committed. So to uproot the dispositions. And again, we've said in the past that it's much easier to do when those are in their infancy those, you know, the sinful tendencies to rip up a sapling a root and all is easy. You know, to rip up a, an oak tree is a, another matter. And so in the spiritual life, there has to be a kind of vigilance that, you know, that we do, as they say, shut the door before the head of the serpent gets in. Because once the head is in, it's, it's over. You know, the, the snake is going to be in in the room, and so you know, to pull out all the opportunities. And we've talked a little bit about this in the past. You know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Well, if say a, a man is having trouble with internet pornography, then you know there should be no he hesitancy upon the part of a priest or spiritual director to say you can't use. The computer, and that might be a heck of a sacrifice, you know, in the sense everybody, you know, we're so used to and tied into using uh, the computer that the idea of cutting it out or television, you know, things, anything that could lead us into that might seem extreme, but it's, it is realistic, especially when, you know, it has almost reached the level of addiction. And basically, that's what passions are. You know, sins so, become so deeply rooted in us that, you know, they become these dispositions where we, our natural step almost is to enter into the sin. We've been formed by those sins so deeply. And so it becomes very difficult unless we can put ourselves in a situation or an environment where we can remove the very things that are a source of temptation for us. And is there a willingness or the resolve to do that? And of, often case not. I, I, I think we, we're often willing, I think we want to God, God to do things magically for us, you know, to remove the passion from us while we still expose ourselves to everything that would lead us into sin, you know, that there would be no struggle there whatsoever. Any thoughts? Yes. There is a, a motion picture film about um, the issue of uh, addiction, sex mm -hmm. addiction, in which the main protagonist. 
tagging is actually has to go to for his work, he has to leave town, he has to stay in a hotel, but as soon as he gets there, he has to best come up and take the television out of him. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's more common than people realize. And uh, but I think that's what it's going to take. You know, people like setting aside watching television or movies, and not really going on the internet. You know, except for work, maybe. You know that it's just become so prevalent, and has taken such hold. It's so powerful. You know the. Uh, because of the visual images now, you know, that's live I images, movies, you know, basically. So I think, and it's so accessible from any place, even from one's phone, that it becomes something that's very difficult to overcome. And so, you know, th this is where the, the difficulty comes in and where the, the need for a strong resolve comes in, that we're willing to, 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 to do such things. What does this look like you know, when relationships become like even not just like uh, friendships, but maybe work relationships, or I think become a source of temptation, or even a source of pride or anger, things like that. Mm -hmm. Like cutting out causes. Obviously, I can't make my coworker vanish. <laughs> right. Right. But um, <laughs> you know, like an interior. I could take care this. of that for you. I, I, I have some friends in one of the neighborhoods over here who can make them disappear for you. <laughs> but maybe, an in, I don't know, interior approaches to cutting out a cause of something that um, may not be possible with regards to removing yourself from. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's inevitable. I think we have to understand that it's going inevitable. Even if a person is married, that their spouse is not going to be able to, you know, be God for them or satisfy every need, and, uh, and even you know, in terms of their personality, they might be great, they might be witty, but they're still not. They're not going to have everything. There's, the, uh, you're going to meet somebody who the, perhaps there's something about their personality, their sense of humor. Or a connection over, you know, this worldview where you're able to engage them, and so strong feelings can develop very quickly, and so having a kind of watchfulness of heart about that becomes very important, uh, and to have it early on, I think, is is the thing because once once it develops and goes further, and steps are taken where. Uh, you know, that's allowed to grow to such an extent that it takes a hold of the heart, then it does require something maybe more radical. Like if a person is in risk of infidelity to their spouse because of it, then they might have to quit their job. I mean, does that seem extreme? I mean, if they aren't, I mean, if it's re reached a point where that's the real danger then, that say they've become deeply emotionally involved and uh, with someone who's not their spouse and they're engaging them even more than their spouse and, and it's gain, gaining steam. They're, they're not going to back up, be able to back off of that easily unless they really are willing to cut it out of their life. And I think that's why Jesus used that phrase. So, I mean, we have a tendency to make that hyperbole but I think what he's saying is that there are times in our life where in order to pr preserve ourselves from sin that we are going to have to cut out things that are very painful. And so for a person to do that at that point could be very painful. You know, a change of career or they might have to talk to their spouse about it, you know, might be a very difficult thing to do. So having, you know, this clear sense of what's going on within and understanding that, you know, that's probably an inevitable thing that's going to happen, and maybe even multiple times throughout the course of one's life. But that means that we have to always be watching what's going on 
within, but it stays measured and that we don't allow it to become something that we would want it not to become. And that we're also, we give enough care, we have enough care and affection for the other person that we're also seeking to be attentive to, to their life and their feelings and their virtue. And once, uh, once we get wrapped in that so deeply, it often becomes hard to think in that fashion. sounds contradictory to what we just previously read because it sounds like the goal is forgetting the, the sin whereas previously it was almost like remembrance of it in order to battle with it yeah you came in a little late oh. you know? <laughs> no not to embarrass you but uh, the idea here is that there is something different with the carnal passions those that have to deal with our, our bodily passions that they we would treat them in a different fashion, because to to bring them to memory would be to draw ourselves back into them. <laughs> These guys do that all the time. They do it in almost any chapter. They will run something all the way to the end of the rails, <laughs> and they'll make a definitive statement, and then they turn the car around, <laughs> and they come back this way. <laughs> you know? And it was just the way they talk. And, then, and if, you, if you stop at the end of the first running it off the rails, then you think they're, what, was, what did they accuse him of? Neo, whatever it was? Uh, Neo Pelagianism. Yeah, right. yeah, but hang on, to flip the page. Semi Pelagian. <laughs> <Come back. laughs> right. I don't know, it's a funny way of looking yeah. things. It's beautiful the way they do Well, it. I think it's because it does mean reading him not as a theologian, but reading him as what he was a desert monk who entered into the laboratory of the desert to engage in this spiritual battle. And, you know, in psychoanalysis, it's not like a hard and fast science. You know, you're dealing with the mystery of the human person there and what emerges from the deepest parts of the, the unconscious. And so here, the, these are men who lived there over the course of their entire life, and there's this uh, corporate wisdom that's developed, you know, and uh, they're not always going to be able to articulate it with the precision that we're forcing on them, especially often from the West to, you know, where people like to think of terms, uh, th uh, think of things in terms of clear definitions, you know, what Aquinas said, you know, so criticizing John Cassian in, in accord with what Aquinas said about something, and it's not a fair thing to do. I mean, we want to read it with a critical mind so that we don't fall into a kind of Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism, but I think the fair reading is to allow him to speak as who he is. And you have to read him in the way that we do, with a kind of generosity of spirit that's willing to wait and be a little confused and, you know, to deal with the you know jarring language at times, and then allow yourself to come out the other side, but also then to read the text in its entirety, where you begin to see the big picture that they did have this deep understanding of the human person. Might doesn't mean that they saw everything, but they saw a lot. Where are we here? I lost my. Are we that far down? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> but this understanding of the aforementioned forgetfulness refers only to the grave sins that are also condemned by the Mosaic Law, the dispositions to which are put, as, are put aside and destroyed by a good way of life. So too their repentance has an end. But there will be no end of penance for those little offenses by which the righteous person falls seven times, as it is written, and gets up again. For we commit these frequently every day, unwillingly or willingly, whether through ignorance or forgetfulness, or thought or word, or surprise, or necessity, or weakness of the flesh, or pollution during a dream. On account of these, David asked the Lord in prayer for purification and forgiveness, saying, 
who understands his sins. From my hidden ones, cleanse me, and from those of others, spare your servant. And the apostle says, the good that I want, I do not do, but the evil that I do not want, this I do. And on their account, he also cried out mournfully, wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body, from the body of this death? For in these things we slip so easily, as if by a natural law, that they cannot be completely avoided, however cautious and carefully they are guarded against. One of the disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, spoke about these in a very few words when he said, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and his word is not in us. Hence it will be of no great help to the person who desires to arrive at the height of perfection, to have attained to the end of repentance, that is, abstaining from what is unlawful, if he does not also constantly and tirelessly reach out to those virtues by which one attains the marks of reparation. For it is not enough for someone to abstain from the stinking filth of sins that disgust the Lord, if he does not also possess, through purity of heart and the perfection of apostolic love, that good fragrance of virtuousness wherein the Lord takes delight. Thus far did Abba Panufius discuss the mark of reparation and the end of repentance. Although he beseeched us with anxious love to choose to stay in his synobium, nonetheless, when he could not keep us, drawn on as we were by the reputation of the desert of Skeet, he let us go. And so, you know, everything that we've been talking about certainly has to do with the graver sins that we would struggle with in the spiritual life. But repentance is an ongoing thing for us because the reality uh, is, is that we struggle from human weakness. And sin has touched us in such a way that we are often unaware of the ways that we sin against the Lord. And we're often drawn into the, the, these kinds of sins of human weakness over and over again throughout the course of the day. And so it's important for us to live in this constant state of repentance, of a turning toward God, and develop a love, a desire for virtue that we're constantly drawn forward in order to pull out the disposition to sin altogether from from us, from ourselves. But it's never as though we can get to this point that we can say with certainty, I have no sin. You know, we make ourselves a liar when we do that. Isn't that that 12-1 little paragraph is the most amazing thing? Because I think, especially the first couple of times we met with this, um, this chapter, we would have thought, like, in, in the sense of thinking of the recollection of sins in this legalistic way, like, oh, well, God hasn't forgiven them because those were the really bad ones, or the really mm-hmm. big ones. And, and approaching it that way, then like, how do I know when I'm forgiven? But in this like tiny little part, he turns that all around. And the big ones, the grave ones, are what you do forget and you set aside and you never think about them again. And it's these little offenses that you recall over and over and over again to like continually mortify you and like make you kind of understand your need for mercy. But it, it's the little ones, like the ones you might not even think are that big of a deal. That are. That are. Right. Yeah, it's because the, the standard for us has become the cross by which we measure ourselves. And we know that that's the, the perfection of love. And so even if we have stepped away in large part from all the major sins that we're living from all external appearances of virtuous life, and even if our, our conscience doesn't bother us so much. We know in reality that we aren't simply comparing ourselves with one one another or we're not even judging ourselves at all that what we hold up before our eyes always is the, the standard of love which is the, the cross of Christ. And this always, you know, creates within us a spirit of repentance. We're always humbled by that. thoughts? Mm-hmm. The, uh, 
went back to the catechism and read the whole section about penance, you know. And they, there's a couple things in here when you add it to what he's got here. It's a very wonderful thing. I mean, he presents a wonderful case, a beautiful thing for the, a more robust type of a pen, penance that mm -hmm. we simply don't practice, right? But he did say two or three times very clearly that at the end of this long cycle, forgiveness would come at the end. But that would be, according to what I my understanding of the catechism, that's perfect contrition. But the catechism recognizes the gift of God, imperfect contrition, that, that leads to sacramental confession, allowing for the, the struggle with concupiscence. And so that it almost seems like, well, certainly the, um, the form of, of sacramental confession was different than it is now. But he doesn't, for whatever reason, touch on that imperfect contrition. Maybe that was something just ecclesiastical. Well, because I don't, yeah, you know, I struggled with that a little bit too. And I went back and read the catechism as well. And again, I think we have to read him as he is, okay? And also read him from the perspective of someone who's struggling with, with their sin. Because he says those very provocative statements about forgiveness not being arrived at until the disposition to those sins is uprooted and this, the, the thorn of the conscience is removed, you know, that we no longer feel the sting of that. And, you know, I think what the advantage of reading Cassian in this regard is just that he doesn't allow, you know, the forgiveness and the mercy of, that God gives us to be, become something magical or uh, something mechanical, that it's relational. And that when a relationship is broken, there has to be a repair of it. And that, again, that this isn't a magical thing. And to uproot a sin, you know, and its disposition is a very difficult struggle. And I think were we, even though it says in the Catechism very clearly about the importance of satisfaction. Uh, that's often, I don't think that's in most Catholic Christians' minds when they uh, come to confession, this idea that they are going to make reparation, that, they have, that there needs to be there a desire not to co uh, commit that sin ever again, but also a willingness to make reparation, to do everything that we can by the grace of God that we receive through the sacrament to repair the damage done so that we will pray or fast or whatever is needed in order to prevent ourselves from entering into that sin again. And I think when you read through Cassian, it brings all of that alive. It doesn't allow it to be a definition in a catechism anymore. It all, suddenly, it's pulled into this relationship with God, where we see the true impact of our sin on that relationship, but on ourselves as human beings. And I, I think this, it's altogether lost upon us as Christians. It's true. But it's, but it's more, Father, if you, could, if you don't mind, it's not just a definition of the page. It, it's, it's a mode of truth. It's a dogmatic mode of truth. And it, it has to do with sacramental reality. And I think that is the great thing that the Western Church brings to this, this, this beautiful thing that he's showing us, the more robust, you know, I, I go to confession, I say, and I yeah. yell at my wife and I get three Hail Marys, somebody should probably say, you should do the dishes for a month. <laughs> then, Perhaps so. I'll yeah. probably get shot in the parking lot by all the men. Well, people. no, you're right. You know, I think we, we, we need and we want to have a kind of clarity here in regards to saying that we believe that the, the fullness of God's mercy and forgiveness is offered to us through, through the sacrament. But what reading Cassian does is that, again, it pulls us out of approaching it purely theologically, legalistic, in a legalistic fashion too, looking at it legalistically, that we would go there simply to relieve, again, the burden of a, a sense of shame, you know, uh, free ourselves emotionally 
without uh, keeping in our sight the, this relationship and also the impact of sin upon us. We have lost a sense of sin and the horror of sin and how deeply it, it afflicts us. And I think after reading something like this, you, you can't do that anymore. It, may, it actually makes reparation or repentance something that one would thirst for and desire after re reading this. I think repentance, you know, it has sort of, it can have sort of a negative connotation for us. And, you know, whereas this makes it all about seeking to enter back into that relationship. For You know, he goes through this whole litany of all the ways that the mercy of God flows to us. Do you remember that from early on in the conference? One thing after another that God is coming out to us, offering us his mercy and his forgiveness, and we could take hold of it. And But there has to be this kind of synergy there that we respond to this fully in our lives, take hold of that grace, embrace the healing that he offers. If we approach it legally, you know, a person can be, fall into kind of a scrupulosity or, or just that kind of mechanical thing, I'll do my yearly Easter duty and go to confession. And you have to wonder, well, what, what, what fruit will that bear in a person's life? So yes, you know, I think the clarity that has come, you know, through the development of the theological tradition is important, but it can't be disengaged from the, the lived reality and the experiential knowledge that comes from living out that, that faith. It's a living tradition. And this speaks to it as fully as, as anything else, if not you know, more fully than a lot of the things that we would read in terms of the disposition that we should have in our struggle with sin and to embrace the, the mercy and love of God. A person could pick up that in the catechism, read that definition, and not be moved. A person who picks up the conferences and reads them, their, their life is never going to be the same again, if they read it honestly. What do you, uh, I mean, this brings up, I think, um, for me, I mean, this produces, even reading it, um, a desire for kind of greater satisfaction, a, gr a desire for a greater sense of reparation, the call to reparation, the duty, the obligation, the even the in the, in the best sense of that word mm -hmm. um, to repair that relationship, mm -hmm. and yet, um, you know, you don't always, you know, you don't don't always leave the the sacrament. Um, with penance that would feel like it's <laughs> it is doing that mm -hmm. um, that it's it almost sometimes can feel like flippant mm -hmm. or just kind of mechanical mm -hmm. and you know and yet at the same time there seems to be uh, the intuition is that the desert fathers would not advise taking great steps to do reparation without the counsel of a spiritual father. Mm -hmm. So how does, how does that exactly work? I mean, I, I know it's great to have a good pastor right. and to have a spiritual director and like these kinds of things, but that's not something that everybody has access to mm -hmm. within their parish. Right. Well, you know, it's become, like the penance has become almost purely symbolic. Mm -hmm. Say three Hail Marys and three Our Fathers kind of thing. And it's sort of problematic because it does make it, it seems, you know, okay, I have 30 people standing in line, just do this and, you know, you're good to go. And uh, there was a movie once I saw where a little kid witnessed a murder and he, he confesses it and the priest gives him, say, three rosaries. And that's it, Father, you know, <laughs> you know for a murder rap, you know. <laughs> And it, you know, it didn't click for him as a young young child. And I think this is where we lead into the next conference. It's, on, it's entitled On Pentecost, 
but it is really mo moving from living in accord with the law to living in, living in accord with grace, the perfection that grace calls us to, which is far more than what the law required. The law was given because of our sinfulness. And even something like Lent is given to us, a 40-day period where we engage in the life of repentance more deeply because of a weakening among the faithful and living out the faith. Uh, when we go through the next conference, when he's talking about the lightening of the fast after Easter through Pentecost, you know, Germanus asked him this question and, you know, wanting to know about it. And uh, for them, it's, it's no big deal to lighten that because of the reality of what we would be celebrating for a period of time because fasting was a regular part of their daily life all year long. And so the lightening of the fast for them at, up to through Pentecost was just eating that one meal a day like three hours earlier. <laughs> and so it wasn't like gorging themselves as we would have this tendency to do. We often don't think of the life of grace and what it's calling us to, which is the life of perfection in God. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That we're called to love and give ourselves in love, you know, with, without any condition. And he goes, he'll, he'll, he'll take us through one thing after another of what the law said, but then what the life of grace calls us to. And it's always far, far more. And uh, what was your question again? I lost that <laughs> word. The question just essentially being, you know, what do you do when you leave the sacrament? Right. Feeling like so, okay, so a symbolic penance then that could be done there even within the church would be suitable because if, you know, a way of helping a person reflect and begin that reflection upon their repentance and seeking that reparation, if that was going on in their life as a whole. Like if we were formed to understand our life and the importance of repentance and reparation like this, it would be a constant thing in our life. And so to go to the sacrament of penance, to receive a penance there that is lighter, is not going to have an impact upon us because we, we know, okay, this is just part of the reality that we are entering into. So we, we say this is more symbolically of the reality of penance that we're embracing in, in fuller measure in our life. But we have this tendency to be minimalist, and so we'll, we'll take that, well, okay, that's sufficient. I'll say my three Hail Marys, and then, again, that's it not thinking about, does that really have any impact at all upon my relationship with God and of overcoming that vice? And I think we can say pretty clearly no, if that's how we're looking at it. If we're looking at it only as you know, a mechanical thing or a legal f fulfillment. There, we're satisfying that like God is up in heaven counting these Hail Marys. So unless we do those three Hail Marys, you know, that we, you know, aren't offering satisfaction for that sin, you know, the reparation, it completely misses the, the portrait that's been painted for us here in this conference. So that simple penance would be fine, just like lightening the fast would be fine during, during Pente uh, the, the season of Easter up through Pentecost, if fasting were part of our life all the rest of the year. You know, but if we're only fasting and minimally at that during Lent, and then you know, lightening it by just you know, eating without measure throughout Easter and throughout the rest of the year, then, then what, what meaning does that have? None. You know, Lent should be something that helps us leap forward in order that that asceticism grows and deepens throughout the course of our life. 
not in the sense that we're constantly taking more and more upon ourselves, the, but the spirit of it is embraced with greater perfection throughout the course of our life. Our entering into those 40 days enlivens us again, sharpens our vision, not something that we do you know, as a test of strength once a year for, for 40 days, and then relax the rest of the year, basically doing nothing. It seems that in this, it's not that the, the sacrament of confession is not like sufficient or enough to, to make satisfaction for something. It, it, it feels like they're working on a foundation in which the satisfaction has already been made. I mean, our going to confession isn't making satisfaction for the sins, it's seeking healing, it's mm -hmm. presenting them. Like, that's not thought of by them as like, I'm gonna do this really humbling thing. It, it's just a, it's a presentation of our wounds before mm -hmm. the divine healer, and he's mm -hmm. already made all the satisfaction. So, so the confession itself isn't, you know, anything, it's, it's that. It's healing for us. And the, the penance, you've spoken a lot before about, um, in the context of the daughters meeting, that, that entering into this life of like prayer and union with Christ, it's not making satisfaction with him because we can't and that's already been done. It's entering into the life of the Trinity, which is, complete self-giving and complete and perfect love. So the, this, this foundation, that seem, it, it seems like the foundation of going to confession and receiving absolution and doing a penance is, is given for them. Like that has been done and on this foundation they raise the standard of love, which is, is the cross. And so in all of this, the, they're the, the grief and the desire for penance and reparation is all the, in the breach of, of love. I mean, you know, um, right. which makes point. sense yeah. why they would. Right, but there, there's a lot that's ones. taken for granted. The same is true with Climacus, too. The, there's a life lived in the context of the reality of the church, which includes the sacramental life. So in Climacus, you have no mention, really, of the, of the sacraments and that being a regular part of the pre of their spiritual practice because it's a given that that's what they they would be doing. What they're talking about is what's going on within the heart and how to overcome the vice, how to apply the healing balm to repair the damage that's been done. So that again, there is this view of the East of the church being more like a hospital and applying you know the, the remedies that have been given to us. So there's no sense of pride in the reparation, but we're simply embracing the means that God has given to us, you know, to apply that grace to the areas where we are most wounded. And, it, and, it, and almost like seeing these, these little offenses, recalling them over and over again as these grievous faults in the context of the forgiveness of God that they take that that's a that's a given here like I've received his forgiveness obviously because it's freely given and I've gone to confession which makes these breaches of my being invited into the life of the Trinity and into this life of perfect love even worse so it it seems like well why are you know why do you meditate so much on these little faults it's because they are worse in the context of having been forgiven and absolved Right, and I think this will come out in the next conference with an even greater clarity. You know, what, what it is to live the life of grace in comparison to the, you know, in accord with the law. And the, both the freedom of that, but also the perfection of that and what, what it looks like. And it will be a pretty powerful conference, I think, for all of us. Again, sort of challenging our perception of things.
So let's see. We'll, we finished uh, conference 20, and we'll stop there wow. for evening and pick up next week. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.